Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first in a series of uh, discussions on alternative investments brought to you in association with Suntown Financial Services. Uh, wow, it looks like there are well over 500 uh, in attendance this evening, so no pressure to the panel. <laughs> um, but uh, with the insights of our invited experts, I believe this will be an informative, but also uh, let's hope it's a, a fun fun event for everybody as well. Um, just a few disclaimers uh, to raise at the beginning of our discussions uh, off-site. Off um, well, alternative asset classes such as wine, classic cars, watches, and even sneakers and handbags these days are getting much attention and reaping some serious rewards for a lot of people who making some uh, informed uh, decisions and investments. Uh, we have to uh, state that it is unreasonable to claim uh, any, um, anything these days is a sure bet. Um, I, I, for one, am also not an expert, and I leave all the uh, expert um, opinions up, up to my uh, esteemed panel here as well. But uh, yeah, just to get that out of the way. Um, but the, we hope these wanted sessions will provide you with some valuable insights, experiences, and guidelines and beautiful anecdotes to assist you in making more informed choices should you head down this route, uh, which we hope you do. It's very exciting. While, while collectors have been chasing rare pieces for decades, even centuries, it is uncertain in these sort of uncertain times that people start looking uh, at alternative uh, investments and reassessing their traditional mechanisms of saving and uh, investing. What, uh, what's appealing about these alternative categories is that they also bring you uh, great joy um, while hedging your bets. Um, it's this kind of joy and passion that uh, for old, old school machines and uh, both large and small that kind of feed my enthusiasm and, and inspire me to write my columns every, every week. Um, However, again, as I say, I'm an expert and I welcome our specialists who happen to also be great storytellers. One of them is Paul Butras, who joins us from New York City. Welcome, Paul. Uh, Paul is the head of Watches Americas for Philips, the leading auction house dedicated to collectors' watches. Uh, he helped establish and build the watch department uh, since its launch in 2014, so has a wealth of information experience in, in the field. If you Google Paul, you'll see he's probably just as much uh, as a major celebrity as some of the uh, owners of the watches that he's uh, been involved in bringing to market. Um, and his efforts have contributed to multiple record-breaking results, including that very famous Paul Newman Rolex Daytona, which sold in 2017 for uh, well over 17 million US dollars. Um, I'm not sure how many US dollars that translate to in our little rand, but it's huge. I believe that is still the highest result ever achieved for watch at auction, Paul. Is that correct? Uh, thank you very much, Gary. It, it is the highest um, price ever achieved for a, for a vintage wristwatch. Uh, at the time, it was the highest price ever for any wristwatch ever sold at auction. Okay. All right. Of course, uh, you're also a passionate collector, um, and you also work on, obviously, into, uh, authentication and valuation of investment-grade uh, wristwatches. Um, I believe not only at Philips, but also uh, privately, is that correct? Yeah, yes, we, um, we help. Um, I mean, I have um, a consultancy as well, uh, where, I, where I help brands and private collectors uh, build world-class collections uh, and timepiece collections as well. Maybe you can give us some help on that a little bit later in the session. Our local guest is Peter McClip, who needs very little introduction. But for those newcomers, Peter is a specialist in the secondary market, which means that he's not only a trader, but a, a pre-owned timepieces, but a custodian or some, or I like to see him as a sort of marriage broker of sorts of much loved watches and passes them on between generations. Peter is, has an incredible encyclopedic knowledge of the most valuable uh, and important brands, but also a wealth of wonderful, entertaining stories from over 30 years in the business. Welcome, Peter. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and Karen Murren, I welcome you from uh, our generous uh, collaborators Santum, from Santum uh, Segment Man Solutions, uh, who joins us uh, to tell us about some of the bespoke insurance packages that will offer us some peace of mind while we're out there enjoying these uh, wonderful uh, assets. Welcome, Karen. Thank you. But first, Paul, let's rev things up a little as only an auctioneer can do. Um, at your December sale last year, 40% um, of the 
revenue was generated from apparently seven pieces uh, previously owned by celebrities. Um, another, another Paul Newman, a Hoya Monaco, uh, owned by Steve McQueen, a couple of Sly Stallone pieces like the Panerai Lumino, I believe, and even uh, golfer Jack Nicklaus uh, just brought in a pretty penny there. Uh, could you tell us about some, apart from these, I mean, obvious uh, highlights that we've seen in the press recently, I mean, some of your career highlights, and then maybe just tell us what's coming up in the, uh, in your Geneva watch auction, which everybody seems to be talking about at the moment. No, oh, thank you. Thank you, Gary. Um, ha happy to uh, talk about the Racing Pulse auction that we, we held in December 2020, where you mentioned we sold several celebrity timepieces, including the second um, vintage Rolex Daytona owned by Paul Newman. Uh, that sold for approximately five and a half million dollars, uh, which is a career highlight for me indeed, uh, following the record breaking result of the first Paul Newman Daytona that achieved $17.8 million. Um, yes, we, we have um, developed a reputation of getting great results for celebrity owned timepieces. Uh, including an Omega wristwatch uh, that sold in Geneva in 2018, uh, an Omega watch uh, that achieved $1.8 million, which still today is the highest price ever achieved for an Omega wristwatch. Um, but outside of the celebrity-owned timepieces, uh, the results in December shined a light on the rising demand in independent makers, um, the continued strong demand in vintage Rolex sports watches, complicated vintage Patek Philippe wristwatches. We sold a perpetual calendar, a reference 3448 from Patek Philippe made in 1970, consigned by the original owner's family. Uh, it was the best preserved example we had ever seen, a first series uh, complete with its original certificate of origin, and that achieved a world record price for that uh, style of reference uh, of 530,000 US dollars. Yeah, so the market it remains very strong and um, the Racing Pulse auction was a career highlight in, indeed where we achieved $27.5 million with just 137 lots offered. Uh, a truly exceptional result showing the strength of the market today. Would you say that post the, the uh, 2017 sale of that, the Paul Newman Daytona that there was there was th that the interest in, in, in the market has grown, has spiked? Without a doubt. Uh, I mean, when, when we sold that watch, the, the, the press coverage just blew away our expectations. That news where you have, you know, a world-class brand, Rolex, a one in a million celebrity known around the world, Paul Newman, and a world record price, uh, an eye-watering record price of 17.8 million, the amount of news coverage we, we received and, and the watch community, the watch world saw was just um, the most ever. And that is one thing we love to do at, at Philips and as collectors uh, ourselves is we love to spread the word of the greatness of the world of collectors watches and getting such great results really amplifies our messaging and reaches people all around the world. And I truly believe that that result and, and the press coverage that ensued opened so many more people's eyes to collectors' watches and brought many more clients to us, but also to brands as, as newcomers uh, to buying their first fine, fine wristwatch. Thank you. Peter, on the, on the local uh, scene, um, obviously our, our celebrities tend to be more uh, in the sporting realm, rugby, cricket, yep. and golf stars, which we treat like gods locally. Um, but they're also internationally known. I mean, people like, you know, Gary Player and plenty of our, our rugby players are, are known internationally. I mean, I've traveled with some of them, and I know when you hit an airport anywhere, everybody knows exactly who they are. Um, but have, have you had any of their watches pass your desk or any other highlights you'd like to share from your, your vast career in, in the industry? In 30 years of trading, um, I've had probably as, as big as one can get in celebrity watches in South Africa. Unfortunately, none of them are, are that internationally note, noteworthy. Yeah. Um, let me just say, I've, I've seen the best and worst of clients in my office. Um, certainly a lot of, a lot of color. Um, 
but it's my business is about the love of watches. My business is about the love and the passion of watches. And, you know, sometimes the sale, sometimes the sale doesn't need to be a great sale. It just has to be a joyous sale. There's a there's a joy in buying watches. I had a beautiful sale two weeks ago. The father walks in with three sons. It was their 21st birthday. They were triplets. And he handed them over to me in the next two, three hours. They they climbed all over my desk and touched watches. And, and two hours later, each of them had on their watch, had on their arm a beautiful watch. It was a watch of their dreams. And, you know, I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure I've ensured them to be clients forever. But that was a joyous sale. It was it was just youngsters learning about watches. I answered all their questions. I, and it, 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 was a, it, was a, it was just a fantastic set. Um, and father, father and three sons left here very happy. I obviously was, was very happy. It was a great set. But yeah, as I say, we don't see celebrities, but we see, let's say, joyous sales. I've had, I've had three generations of the same family buying Patek Philippe. It was an old... It was, you know, it was something that's been in the family kind of forever. So yeah, um, more than more than talking about the quantum of the sale, it's more about the joy of the sale to me. Watches, you know, watches, watches have been my joy forever. And it's it's lovely to impart that on other people. Without re revealing any of your your customers' names, I'm just I'm intrigued by you know having. Well, I mean, obviously, triplets doesn't mean they're identical in, in any way. I'm sure they all have their own personalities. I'm intrigued to know what, what three individuals, same age, similar, similar DNA and whatever, have, have, might have chosen uh, and what that says about them. The, that, was, that was what was so interesting. It was three kids from the same room and from the same womb, and they were, and they were the one chose a, a vintage Submariner, the other one chose a um, a, a Hoyer sports watch and the third one an elegant dress watch and these were three boys from the same home and they were and each of them I suppose there was a huge variety to choose from but they they all honed in on on what would finally make them really happy and it was it was absolutely beautiful it was a it was a very memorable sale um, I suppose that's my business is Guys ful ful fulfilling their watch dreams. Paul, back to you. Um, there's nothing like a sale of a, a you know, big sale to create a frenzy, as as, we, as you mentioned, and obviously the media coverage that follows. But um, Philips is focused mainly on uh, very premium brands, rare museum quality pieces, and of course those with the celebrity provenance. Um, and you're in a very powerful position to direct the interest and perceived market value of brands through storytelling and, of course, sales, which I'm assuming has a trickle-down effect across the markets. Do you, do you see this? I mean, you know, you mentioned, obviously, the growing interest in, in, in watches and collecting. I mean, you know, does this not suddenly increase the, the, the value of, of, of related brands so they become out of reach of, of, of a young collector or a new collector? Yeah, well, you know, we... We search the world for the best wristwatches that we believe have enduring value, but also enduring appeal. And by best, that doesn't mean highest price. That means best preserved, iconic models, finest brands, brands with a history of innovation and original designs, um, models that are iconic. These are the things that we're looking for that we would personally buy with our own funds and what we want to offer to our clients. And we're looking for, for watches at all price points as we want to appeal to as many potential clients as possible. You don't need to be a millionaire or a billionaire to be a Philips client by, by no means. Uh, we have watches that start as low as $500 offered in our auctions. For us to choose such a watch, we have to love it ourselves and believe in it. And if, if the quality is, if the condition is great, the originality is correct, and we see a long-term, um, we see clients who, who will enjoy them for the long-term, that's when we'll, we'll include it. So we, we, we understand that you know, our catalogs are widely read and people are looking at our auction results and trying to get a sense of what's in and what's in demand, uh, but we really truly choose watches based on our passion uh, and our, our feeling for what's, what's a great watch. 
Oren, a question for you. Um, I'm assuming that uh, your special uh, bespoke packages from the segment solutions came about due to an increase also in demand for such a, a service. Um, could, you, could you give us a little bit of background to how this all came about? I mean, have you seen noticed a shift to alternative asset classes? Uh, we definitely have, and Gary, perhaps some um, detail first on segment solutions. Uh, segment solutions is a new way of doing business. So traditionally, we developed and marketed products based on perils, but our new way of doing business and to sell products to market is packaged solutions around risk. Yeah. So we thus focus on these segments with underwriting specialists with in-depth knowledge on the specific segment and add value supporting brokers and clients with specialist knowledge, underwriting, risk management and mitigation. Now, our segment solutions currently includes the following segments. So we've got Prevay in there, which is our largest segment, um, looking at mid-corporate um, property uh, business with property risk and BI greater than 250 million. We've got our hospitality and leisure, our real estate and agri. And then specific to answer your question, our executive offering as a bespoke solution specifically suited for discerning individuals looking to ensure their most valuable assets. And the creation of this product um, that we launched early last year was exactly because there's a shift with various of these alternative assets um, and have a need for special insurance. And that obviously extends beyond watches to cars and uh, everything else. Absolutely. From fine art to whiskies, um, classic vehicles, um, all assets. And, and the movement now with the alternative assets is increasing. There's a, a lot more. If you saw the Bloomberg article, um, which we constantly are looking at and what's the best way to ensure these assets. Well, and, and locally, obviously, wines, which is also a big category internationally. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Peter, back to yeah. you. Um, what was your first watch? My first watch was... Can you remember that far back? I can, actually. Nobody's ever asked me that before. For my bar mitzvah, I got a flipper fortis. It was one of the first plastic all-weather diving watches. It was many years ago. Um, and I, I, in fact, haven't thought about that in forever. But... Yeah, that was my a flipper portis. I remember it well. But I'd, I'd always had a passion for watches. From from my early teens, I'd always had a madness for watches. Yeah. So, so the business has kind of suited me well. Yeah. <laughs> um, a question. Since, since then, I'm pleased to say I've owned a couple more. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Peter, there's a question from the audience um, that, yeah. that relates to this, I guess. Um, you know, with with uh, digital watches and all the features on them, and this kind of you know overly connected world we're in. I mean, I, I obviously have conversations with young, so I see a shift in, in and obviously an increasing interest in in uh, in vintage watches. But what are you seeing on on your side? I mean, you just had this engagement with your twenty one year olds that bought. I mean, the vintage the Mariner and everything. I mean, they obviously know what they what they're looking for. Um. You know, I worry that the kids of today aren't being shown watches. They're not being subjected to watches as we were. My dad loved watches. So our generation, my dad's generation loved watches. I worry that younger kids today are seeing, seeing their fathers wearing Apple watches and they'll, they'll never really get, they'll never really get aligned with watches. I, I fear that there are, there'll be, there'll always be luxury watches, but a, I think kids of today are going to lose lose the love of analog watches. I mean, many of them can't tell the time on analog watches. So I fear for that. And yet I'm sure there'll always be those that that will appreciate the luxury of a fine watch, the the beauty of a mechanical watch. Well, I'm hoping everybody gets digital fatigue um, because... Uh, we'll I, wonder, I wonder if it can ever be reversed. I don't know. I wish it would. Yeah. Paul? I have, I have interesting enough had clients walking in with a fine automatic began on one end and an Apple watch on the other. But, you know, that's... 
<laughs> that's just the way the world goes. I'm happy to chime in on that topic. Um, maybe a little different per perspective um, that, that sort of uh, I've noticed. And maybe five, six, seven years ago, pre-Apple Watch era, the pendulum was swinging really away from wristwatches to you know, the younger generations telling time on their phones. I don't need a watch on my wrist. My phone tells me the time. Then the Apple Watch comes out. And the good thing is, is it got people thinking about wristwatches once again. And many more young people are thinking, hey, you know what? I need an Apple Watch. I want to wear a watch on my wrist. And the good thing is, is the wristwatch has not gone the way of the dodo bird. It's actually got a newfound life. And you know what? People, as they mature, as they get more income, as they still start to want to differentiate themselves, because everyone's got an Apple Watch, they open their eyes to, hey, I want to do something a little different. Oh, and then they discover that there's this whole world of luxury watches, which are not disposable. They will last an eternity. They can pass it down to the next generation. And they get into the world of fine watches. And we've absolutely seen that in our client base is many more 20 year olds and, and to 20 to 30 year olds uh, are first time bidders in every auction. And it's, it's wonderful to see. So that's the perspective that, that I've been seeing um, and I've been exposed to. And, and actually I see, I think of the Apple watch as actually having done good for the world of luxury watches. I think there are many people who share that opinion. Yes, well, I hope you're correct. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Paul, what, what, what was your first watch? Oh, it goes way back. I remember being absolutely fascinated with a digital watch, a digital watch, believe it or not. I was about five or six years old, and it was, um, I think it was Casio, worn on the, the priest of our church on his wrist. And I was begging my parents, and I was begging my parents, get me a watch like this. And the priest took it off his wrist and gave it to me. And I remember being so, so happy. And my fascination with watches started back then. But then it was really at the age of 10 when I really discovered mechanical watches. Uh, and then I guess my, my first mechanical watch um, that I purchased with my own money after leaving, you know, after graduating college, uh, was a vintage Rolex Seed Weller, a patent pending uh, Seed Weller uh, from 1967. That, um, you know, because I was an engineer by training, I realized that this word pending, patent pending, could be something very interesting and different. And uh, that really um, got me super excited about the world of vintage and the nuances and the minutiae that separates a common watch from, from an exceptional watch. Uh, so that was really my first purchase with my own, you know, significant purchase with my own money. Please tell me you still have that watch. Nope, I sold it four years after I bought it. <laughs> times how much I paid. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Thought about that often, huh? <laughs> Paul, Paul, just keeping, keeping your, your collector's hat on, um, what advice do you have for someone starting out who may feel a little bit overwhelmed by uh, some of these big celebrity dollars? And I know you said some of your watches start as low as 500 US dollars. Um, but where, I mean, where else, where else do you start? I mean, where else, where else do you look when you're looking around? I mean, besides auctions, I mean. You know, yes, where, I mean, place, so. it's essential that you go out and touch and feel and try on watches. Uh, because there's no better way to have uh, a watch that you'll enjoy for many years than knowing that it fits your wrist well. So wrist fit and wrist comfort, you can't determine that from a picture. You can't determine that from a press release or a catalog. You can only know it when you put it on your wrist. So my advice to anyone new to watches is get out to shops, go to vintage dealers, go to watch uh, authorized retailers, go to auction previews. There's zero pressure in an auction preview and you get to sample hundreds of watches from all different eras and try them on and um, look at them and speak to specialists and other collectors. So number one thing is educate yourself, understand your own sensibilities and, and focus on those brands that appeal to your sensibilities, but also, you know, cho be choosy. There's thousands of brands out there and it's up to you to be judicious and choose those brands that are, you know, doing original things. There's so many brands that are derived from others I recommend 
by the watches from the originators, those who are pushing the state of the art of watchmaking and have a history of pushing the state of the art of watchmaking and offering great watches at their rel relative price point. So they're finishing matches their price points. So that's what I'm always recommending. And there are great watches at the $100 level, the $1,000 level, the $10,000 level, the million dollar level. So understand your budget and focus on those brands that appeal to you most, but educate yourself as best as you can. Right. Very good. Good advice. It just it is a, 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 I mean, it was bound to pop up a COVID, COVID related uh, question and, and whether, whether the industry would survive this one like they survived the last uh, uh, crisis, the financial crisis. But also, I mean, I'd like to just throw in, you know, obviously things have moved uh, fast tracked online. Um, so, and, and I know within the auction space, obviously a lot of, a lot of your big clients are probably have been, you know, offline anyway, phone, phone bids, whatever. So you don't really see them, but a lot of, a lot of what you do, as you're saying, it's good to try on see touch feel and for, for Peter and, and Paul, you know, I mean, how, you know, I think how, how is, how is this last year with this kind of fast tracking into the digital realm affected your business in both good or bad? You'd have to unmute. Peter, you'd have to unmute. Right, got it. Um, you know, what Paul was saying about the tactile effect of watches, I've always, watches to me have always been very tactile. Now, Geez, they were never going to sell online. I never believed that watches would sell online just because in order to, to touch a watch and feel a watch to appreciate it, you know, it's, you've, got to, you've got to have it on your arm. And strangely enough, this COVID has sort of accelerated internet watch sales to a ridiculous degree that you know, I can't believe the watches that I the watch sales that are happening online in 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 size in the amount of money that people are prepared to spend without touching a watch, it always surprises me. And yet this is the way of the world. Um, to me, to, I, I, I can't buy a watch unless, I'm, I'm, unless I put it onto my arm. It is very tactile. And yet, as I say, COVID, COVID has changed all of this. Um, guys are spending outrageous amount, amounts of money. So yes, my business is working with it. Uh, being old fashioned, I miss... I miss those old days of sitting with clients and regaling them in the stories, telling the telling the stories, letting them feel the passion. But I suppose this is this is the new way of the world in this in these in this COVID world. Um, so yeah, turnover wise, I'm unaffected. In fact, I'm better off than before. Uh, I do miss I do miss the tactile effect of watches, but it's working. And Paul. Um, do you do you see a, a sort of spike in interest? Uh, you know, I, I know that you you established uh, the division well after the last financial crisis, but I mean, do you have you, you know, come if you're sort of tracking interest in 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 in, in this segment? I mean, do you see a kind of uh, a spike in interest when when we have a kind of uh, unstable environment? Uh, yeah, I mean, speaking of the COVID era we saw uh, significant interest uh, in watches from existing clients, but also many new clients. Um, and and I, I attribute it to the fact that, you know, a couple of factors, people have more time on their hands, they're, they're spending more time at home for one and getting deeper into their passions, whether it be cooking, photography, um, car collecting, watch collecting, uh, we saw a lot, I mean, I had many more phone conversations with collectors than ever before because people had the time to dedicate to becoming a better collector. Uh, you, you have uncertainty in the world and uncertainty in terms of interest rates, in terms of currency exchange rates. Uh, and people were looking for, are looking for safe havens in, in, in that type of uh, uncertain environment. And for, for people who love watches, they felt, hey, you know what? I've got more money now, and, and there's been a huge in, in, in um, uh, injection of cash around the world with government stimulus. So there is a lot of money out there that is uh, could be put into sa uh, savings savings accounts, into the stock market, into real estate. 
many shows to put it into collectors items like art, like cars, like watches. So yes, there has been a spike in demand, at least for us in, in the field of collectors watches. Uh, and surprisingly, uh, as, as Peter had mentioned, you know, we, we expect this tactile world to be a real driver in people's buying decisions. But the fact that so much information can be presented now online, what we have done is we've adapted and have been doing many Zoom calls like this, one-on-one -on -one with clients, but also instead of physical previews, virtual previews, where we're talking about the watches and they're getting the clients are getting the backstories behind the timepieces that you just don't get from a catalog sometimes. And it's worked out very, very well. So, and we're providing more pictures, a video condition reports, so people can see the watch under different lighting conditions and maybe see a scratch or see how sharp an edge is that um, really has helped in, inform clients. And so it was a world record year. It was a record year for us, but a world record result for any auction department last year. Uh, surprisingly, at the start of the pandemic, we were very fearful, very fearful that it was going to be a disastrous year and it turned out to be exactly the opposite. It was our best year ever. Well, so certainly from uh, the launch of new watches, um, from that point of view, uh, it's been amazing being able to talk to designers, CEOs, whatever, you know, like this, and having their time and focus. Whereas, you know, when you're in, at Basel World or Watches and Wonders now, it's called, you know, everybody's so rushed and so, like, you know, uh, overwhelmed that you don't get the luxury of this time. Unfortunately, yes, you can't touch all the watches, but we will, you know, will soon. But there is, there's, there, I think the two can work, work hand in hand. Um, and, you know, maybe soon we'll be able to just print out 3D versions of those watches so we can touch and feel them while we're talking about them. <laughs> uh, Karin, you're not going to get off lightly. Um, what, what, what was your first watch? Interesting. I also, when Paul was talking, so mine was also a Casio. <laughs> um, so yeah, I had a Casio as a first watch. Yeah. Didn't quite get the fashion Paul had, but yeah. <laughs> what? What? Do you, are you a collector of any sort? I'm not. Um, I definitely, whilst considering for this and doing groundwork for the webinar. I thought what really intrigued me, which I shouldn't probably mention here, was um, maybe I'm missing Scotland and travel. But something that's intriguing me is, is the whiskey. <laughs> so I'll go for a Scottish whiskey. McAllen 1926 got my attention. <laughs> so good category as long as you don't drink it all. <laughs> I shouldn't drink it at all, yes. Actually, uh, another question, I mean, I, I can't remember who the financial advisor was, but uh, one said to me that uh, an asset is a liability until it's sold. I don't know how you, you feel about that. <laughs> no, that's why you've got insurance. So um, if you're aware of your risk and you take care of your risk, um, then you're covered. You should have peace of mind. Um, let me see if we got any more questions from the audience. Uh, uh, changing tastes, uh, you know, uh, over the last, or well, let's not, I mean, somebody asked you over the last century, but I think that's a bit of a long, a long shot. The changing taste in, in watches, uh, to Peter and Paul, I mean, have you, I mean, more recently, do you, do you see that that, I mean, for example, say, you know, when like the new Top Gun movie is coming out, is there, is there kind of boost, I mean, a big interest in pilots watches all of a sudden, or it's, you know, I know that, you know, steel, steel versions of some luxury watches uh, also became very, very popular. Not to say they weren't before, but there seemed to be a more interest in them uh, because they're also quite rare, I suppose. Um, but do you see any, any change in tastes uh, that you could pinpoint over the last maybe five, 10 years? Two, two, two time was quite big in the 80s. Yeah. I'm happy to jump in, Peter. Um, yeah. You know, feel free to add. Um, yes, you know, increasingly, at least from, from our perspective, collectors want what others can't get. And there's been really a recent gravitation towards 
independent watch brands, uh, where it's it's finely craft, it's really um, exemplary hand craftsmanship, and naturally limited production, uh, and clients or uh, collectors really appreciate that. And with these independent brands, they're much smaller. A collector can engage directly with the watchmaker whose name is on the on the dial. And people really enjoy that. And that's sort of a tailored experience that you can't, you just can't get with a big brand like Rolex or Patek Philippe uh, for, for most people. Um, so in the past five to 10 years, I think there's really been a growth in interest in independent makers. Brands like F.P. Jorn, Roger Smith, Kari Boutelainen, uh, MBNF, Zipatune, Laurent Ferrier. These are some of the brands we've seen a lot more interest in lately. Uh, and then obviously sport watches, as, as many know, uh, whether it is luxury sport watches like the Patek Philippe Nautilus, the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak, or vintage sport watches in steel, uh, like vintage Rolex sport watches, especially Omega Speedmasters, or chronographs from brands such as Universal Genève. Um, what people are looking for, I think, with those types of watches are a little bit of status, uh, but also ease of wearing. When you wear a vintage Rolex sport watch, if you scratch it, it's not like a car accident with a very fine watch when you get a scratch. A sports, a tool watch from the 60s is supposed to have scratches. So they're very easy to live with, they're very serviceable. And you know, there's there's been many produced, but there are so many subtle nuances and variations in a particular model for a particular year that collectors are absolutely fascinated by them. But most of all, their size is relevant for today's tastes. So, you know, in the, in the late 90s, 80s and 90s, Rolex bubble backs, Princes, Cartier tanks, Movado watches, they were very popular in far, as far as collectors go, but for today's taste, they're small. These sport watches are, are larger and this is what collectors want today. So that's, that's sort of, uh, you know, as fashion trends change and, and tastes change with fashion, so does um, so do tastes change with world of watches. So essentially, I guess you, you should be buying because you you love the watch, not because uh, you hope to get some major return on, on it. I guess. Um, no, no doubt. No. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. We we never instruct clients to look at watches as an investment. We tell them, hey, look, buy a watch because you love it. If it goes up in value, great. Consider that a great bonus. If it goes down in value, hey, you have a watch that you, you love and you can wear and enjoy for, you know, the rest of your life. Yeah. Just talking, talking of independent uh, watch brands, there's obviously been, uh, I suppose, because of, of, of new technology and, and the connected world, there have been a lot of small independent brands popping up. Uh, you know, there have been some Kickstarter brands. I mean, they're hardly uh, seen as luxury watch categories. Have you been watching any of these youngsters with their new brands? Yeah, uh, Peter. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, certainly, there's there's some fascinating things happening today. I suppose I suppose because the world is all online, you you know, in the old days, you'd need to have a shop which would appeal to a very small amount of people. Whereas today, these watches are branded online, and there's there is there's some very clever things being done. There's clever materials being used. Um, I suppose the technology of today. There can even be small production of watches, which are, um, which can be produced and sold internationally at fair prices. As Paul was saying, it was it's it's individual watchmakers who are who are who can now market to the whole world, and and there, there's some very exciting things happening. I think that is really more for the enjoyment of watches. Um, time will tell as to what kind of values those small those small independent watchmakers will have. Um, I think to have real gravitas takes enormous money in, in terms of the, the, the FP Jeun and in terms of the, the Richard Mill, the, these are companies that have huge money, but the small independent watches, I wonder if they'll ever be collectible besides being enjoyable. The MBFs, will they? Will, will those those have a value in the future? Paul, oh. oh. I I do think they will have um, value. Not all, 
but you know some. So it's it's up to it's up to us to be judicious and choose watches where we think it's not just a fashion trend, but their style will look modern 50 years from now. You know, the most collectible vintage watches look like they could have been made yesterday. I mentioned the Patek Philippe 3448 that achieved a world record price from 1970. You know, 50 some odd years later, today that watch looks like it could have been made yesterday. And that's what I always advise people, be careful. Um, so yes, some of these great brands do make duds. And <laughs> AP, Patek, everyone. Everyone, every brand has a bad day, including the independents. So, so be careful not to buy the bad day if you want to preserve value. Uh, you know, choose choose a watch that you think will look great in the future, and and it suits your sensibilities. So it's hard to it's very hard to predict. Nobody has a crystal ball. If if, if we did, you know, we'd all be wealthy. Um, but I, I I'm with Peter. There's some really interesting uh, young very small independent makers using Kickstarter or using Instagram to sell their, their pieces. And I bought a couple of these and have a, had a lot of fun. I didn't buy them thinking that I'm going to make money off of them. I bought them because maybe I know the person or I like the look, or I think it's a lot of fun for the money. And it, it's part of the enjoyment of watches and, and it's rewarding in its own way. Just, just supporting such, such a small independent brand. Can you, can you tell us some, some independent brands that you think are particularly cool at the moment? Yeah, so from these very small makers, uh, like maybe a micro brand, uh, Ming, Ming watches. Uh, he is an enthusiast, Ming Thien, uh, who I used to participate with on, on watch forums back in the early 2000s, the Purist Pro and also Time Zone. And um, he was always designing imaginary watches and posting his, his designs on the forums. I'm super pleased to see that he's launched his own brand. Uh, the watches start as low as maybe a thousand US dollars. And um, they're very, very well made, uh, very fairly priced. And uh, one, one of his watches, I think it was in 2019, won the Grand Prix d'Or Largerie, uh, Aiguille d'Or, the Golden Hand. Um, or maybe the best man's watch, uh, sorry, probably was not the, the golden hand. Um, I forget exactly what the award was, but he's receiving industry recognition uh, for creating really interesting timepieces at, at the price. But that should surely give him enough credit for the future to place him on a, on a watch list, <laughs> watch out list. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I believe in him. And, and I think um, you know, some of those pieces will, will do well in the future. Are you seeing any of these these small um, artisanal watchmakers coming onto your onto your sales? Yes, yeah. I mean, we 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 choose the watches to feature in our auctions that we believe in, um, and and we do always have MBNF, uh, a maker you, you mentioned, Dibethune. Uh, I think we we auctioned a, a main piece in November 2020. Okay, Stefan Sarpaneva who's a small maker, um, making really good, good watches for the money. We, we love supporting them when, when we believe that they're, they're great. Beautiful. Karen, back to you. Uh, all these talk of, this talk of investments, I mean, how, how can you, I mean, are you able to, I mean, I know it's bespoke packages here, so it's, I mean, it's like asking how long's a piece of string. But how does one go about ensuring uh, premium watches, a collection of watches? Okay, so in the case of our all risk cover and our classic or standard offering, uh, we price separately for jewelry and year client segment, age, geographical area, no claims bonus, and a number of other variables are considered and will result in a differentiated pricing. Of more relevance year is our executive offering. And on the executive, a client chooses a limit for worldwide cover, ranging from 1% of contents of the insured value to 30%. And the premium charge for worldwide cover is dependent on this limit, but the variables I mentioned also play a role. So in this instance, we don't charge any premium for this watch. It is already included under the premium we charge for the worldwide cover under contents. Mm -hmm. 
the client must just ensure that they select the appropriate percentage of the contents um, of the insured value. Okay. And tell me, um, the plastic car market uh, is tracked by the likes of Haggy and there's also Haggerty that, that uh, you know, records uh, the values and increasing values of cars over time based on auction sales and insurance values. What are your uh, mechanisms to, to determine actual value of, of vintage pieces uh, locally? So let's, we've got in group as well our specialist, um, Vantage Insurance, um, which is our motor insurance specialist for the executive market. And they provide comprehensive cover for modern executive and exotic vehicles, as well as collectible and classic cars. And the Vantage MD and seasoned expert is Adrian Lowe. And again, he focuses on three categories in the business, and that's from your executive brand, which will be your Mercedes, BMW, or Audi. And the next category is looking at the exotic vehicles, Porsche and Ferraris, even some specialist sport models of the bigger manufacturers, such as Mercedes-Benz, the SL models. And then I think where you're talking uh, or asking about is, is your hobby enthusiasts. So this, this category have an interest in classic cars specifically, and normally they are part of a club with members of similar interests. And and appreciation for the social aspects. Yeah. Now, interesting to share is the SA market is small in comparison with the UK market. In UK, you've got a million of these cars with a market size of 7.2 billion in pounds. Our own market in South Africa is around the 100 million market size. But it's a very dedicated market with very strong management and the loss ratio under 30%. And hence, these premiums are one third of the standard premium. So, Gary, criteria, criteria are typical low vehicle use, obviously, it's a classic. And to zoom into your question, um, it, it's tough to get to that agreed value, or it remains a challenge, as we don't have international accredited appraisers. So together with evaluation certificates, the model clubs assist with the in-depth experience and expertise to ascertain the value um, and then value should be reviewed every 24 months. Thank you. Paul, um, we've just got a couple more questions coming in here and I think you can answer this one. Uh, there's a question, uh, I'm assuming the PP is particularly uh, 5711, why, why is it so expensive, in your opinion? Oh, <laughs> that, that model, um, the market value has sort of gone exponential uh, in the past maybe one and a half to two, to two years. It's, it's supply and demand, limited supply. Patek Philippe doesn't make enough to satisfy demand. Um, in, uh, I, I attribute a lot of it also to, you know, people discovering that model and how hot it is through social media. You know, social media and um, press coverage shine a light on, on this watch and its popularity. And, you know, for example, Instagram, when people post a picture of a particular watch, many notice and they see how many likes a watch achieves. Uh, and certain watches get more likes than others. And then people who are new to watches say, oh, that watch, it's got a lot of likes, must be popular. I want a piece of that. And so there's a lot of, a lot of that going on in the world of, of watches where people are heavily influenced by, you know, this, this phenomenon of, of social media likes, as opposed to you know, people following their own road and choosing watches based on their own discoveries rather than being influenced by other people's tastes. So I, I'm not saying that the Nautilus, is, is, is its popularity is only uh, due to that, but that's, in my humble opinion, a, a big factor. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really, at the end of the day, supply and demand. And of course, now Patek Philippe has discontinued that model. Uh, so that brought more interest and, because people think the supply is now ultimately limited, 
the people who own them said, it's maybe it's time to cash out. Let me ask a high price. And, and there, that's what happens. You know, prices spike. And right now the price is, is quite high. I think the retail last retail price was of approximately 30,000 US dollars. And today the secondary market price is 95,000 to 105,000 for these asking prices. I don't know how much they're selling for, probably around the $95,000 price point. But, um, you know, be careful if you're a buyer and choose wisely. You know, you don't want to buy into a hype watch if you don't believe in it. But if you believe in it, you love it, and you have the means, by all means, go for it. Um, another question uh, on brands. Um, apart from Rolex, which seems to get a lot of attention, um, uh, what other, which other brand besides Rolex and Patek are, are getting some industry, are making some waves in the industry? I, I noticed actually that there's a, there's a lovely long jeans on on your list for the upcoming auction as well, and, and uh, IWC, which is uh, which is also, I mean, you know, g gives hope for those trying to enter the market, I, I guess. But I, you know, I'm sure that long jeans is probably very special and very rare as well. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about that watch, and then what other other brands are, are particularly piquing interest at the moment. Yeah, so um, there's significant interest in Audemars Piguet uh, watches, particularly the Royal Oak or 1980s uh, complicated watches. Um, there's um, the perpetual calendars. There's the day dates with moon phase. There's Cartier watches that are um, really lately have, have uh, found renewed interest like uh, Tonks Entre or the Crash Watch. We see interest, as you said, in, in Longines chronographs, especially the 13ZN. Uh, chronograph, one of the finest chronographs ever made, uh, as as attested to by by many uh, scholars. Uh, still well priced relative to other brands. Um, we 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 see great interest, in, as we had mentioned, in F. P. Journe and in Richard Mille. Um, Vacheron Constantin, uh, exceptional watches, uh, especially vintage watches. Uh, that's an area uh, or a brand which I feel is undervalued and is a great opportunity for collectors to get something exquisite at, at, a, at a very good price. Um, so yeah, I mean, these are the, the makers um, that, that we feature in our sales. Uh, Omega especially uh, is another um, brand, you know, that um, has particular interest. Uh, really, the Speedmaster is, is, is such a great watch. And uh, since 1957, it's been made. There's so many variations and it continues to evolve and fascinate, fascinate collectors. If you were, if you were starting out all over again and, and had, uh, I don't know, um, $5,000 in your pocket, what would you buy? Omega Speedmaster. Uh, Speedmaster? An Omega Speedmaster. Okay. With $5,000 to buy my first watch, that's what I would buy. Peter? Can I interject here? A few years ago, I bought from a farmer called Jack from George, called me up about an Omega Speedmaster and came in this box. It's a very rare box. It's a very rare box. And he then went on to tell me that how special the watch is. Anyway, we managed to do a deal. I did manage to buy it on the phone. And the watch came to me and it's, it is this fantastic watch. It was an Omega Speedmaster, which was, from 1969, there were 1,014 made of them only. Numbers one and two went to Richard Nixon and Spiro Agnew as a, as a gift. And the next went to the astronauts, and there were about 900 which went to the rest of the world. And this one somehow ended up in George, South Africa, at a farmer who decided to sell it on to me. And it's, I have, I have, Sort of richer watches or more spectacular but to me this is just one of the most if i can show it to, to you all it's just one of the most colorful watches that i've ever had and it's just it's just seeped in fantastic history and um and in an almost brand new condition and as i say of, of all the watches that have come through come through me that that amiga speedmasters still probably one of my favorites fantastic peter we're taking consignments for the fall. <laughs> That's what I was getting at. 
I've got more. One to part with. It's a difficult one to part with. It's a very um, much. Congratulations. You know, over the years, I've parted with some, some absolute museum pieces. I must say, in the last few years, I've become more disciplined with hanging on to hanging on to special pieces. I think I sold too many great pieces in my youth. So we learn. Uh, you know, not, not uh, well, all, all Daytonas are created equal in the factory, but clearly not all Daytonas end up the same value out in the market when they resold. Um, there is obviously this crazy craziness around movie memorabilia and, and, and celebrity. Um, but, you know, I suppose a little bit like I, I find when we're looking at like Porsche 911s, I get very confused because there are just so many different iterations of it. and. You know, what is your advice if somebody is looking for a, a Daytona, which is a very beautiful watch, but where, where do you even start? I mean, it's just, it's just, I mean, apart from doing your homework, clearly. Well, it's how, it's, yeah. it's how, how deep is your pocket? It's, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. there, is, there is the current one, which by virtue of the supply and demand that Paul was talking about, is, is, totally, is totally overpriced at the moment, but there's a, there's a history of the Rolex Daytona, which goes all the way back to, to the mid sixties. And I suppose the price escalates as one gets, as one goes backwards, but it's always been, it's, it's always been a fabulous sort of to watch. I think the real intensity came in the late, in the late nineties when, when the Italians decided it was the only watch to wear. And ever since then, it's, there's, there's been an insane pressure on, on Daytona, and it is, it's a, it's a spe spectacular watch. Um, how, how much you're willing to spend on it. Um, yeah, as you hear, somebody was willing to spend $17.25 million yeah. on a particular Daytona. That's how deep is your pocket. Um, still a fantastic watch, still a watch we can never buy enough of because they'll always, they'll always sell. Yeah, I mean, introduced in 1963, just like the Porsche 911, it, it's evolved continuously until today uh, with subtle variations. And exactly as Peter stated, it, it starts with budget. It, it, you know, if your budget is 10,000, you probably can maybe get one that's two tone, gold and steel, uh, from the you know, 90s to the, the 2000s. Um, at 25,000, you can get a steal from the 90s to the, the 2000s. Uh, and then, you know, if you have deeper pockets and, and want a Paul Newman style Daytona, depending on condition, you're talking probably starting price of about $150,000 onwards to over a million to 2 million, depending on the rarity and configuration. So it really, there's a watch for everyone, but really the entry level is is barely 10,000, most likely 12,000 to get into a steel and gold version. But buyer beware. So if you're going into the field of vintage, you know, it's much more difficult than it looks. Buy from a trusted seller who will stand behind their watch and there's a history of doing so. Uh, auction houses, of course, we stand behind the watches we offer. And I'm sure Peter uh, is, a, is a reputable seller who does the same. Yeah, very good, very, very good advice, yes. Unfortunately, the time has come to wrap up. Um, and I'd just like to thank you all for participating. It's been amazing um, sharing your insights and stories. Thank you so much. And thank you to Karen and to Santam for, for supporting us on this. Uh, let's do it again soon. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you all round. I hope everybody enjoyed and got something valuable out of this. I certainly did, uh, learning, learning new things all the time. Uh, but yeah, thank you and hope to see you all soon.